I am Carlton Smith. I am an, an I am a member of the NSBP Student Council. Um, here with me is our uh, speaker for today, uh, Dr. Keith Baker uh, at Yale University, um, uh, who is technically the D. Allen Bromley Professor of Physics at Yale University. In addition to that, we have uh, our affiliates at KITP, Alina and Lisa Stewart, and uh, our wonderful Student Council President, uh, Elon Price. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, at this point, I want to give a brief biography about our speaker. Uh, so, uh, Professor Keith Baker is a, as I said, the D. Allen Bromley Professor of Physics at Yale University. He concentrates on experimental particle physics, including research at the Energy Frontier being conducted at the Atlas Collaboration at the LHC, which is the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator in Geneva, Switzerland, and precision studies at sub-EV energies. He helped build the detectors and was part of the team that carried out the machine learning analysis and the discovery of the Higgs boson, the last elementary particle predicted in what is now known as, well, in what is known as standard model of particle physics. His current research topics include quantum information science in high energy physics, electroweak symmetry breaking, and experiments that test the boundaries of the standard model of physics. Dr. Baker has received numerous awards and honors, including the Edward Boucher Award from the American Physical Society in 2002 for his, his contributions to nuclear and particle physics and for building the infrastructure to do these measurements and for being active in research activities, both locally and nationally. He was the recipient of the Elmer Imes Award for Outstanding Research by the National Society of Black Physicists and the National Conference of Black Physics Students. He also received the E.L. Ham Senior Distinguished Teaching Award and the National Award for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. In 2017, he was honored as a U.S. Atlas Distinguished Researcher. He's a graduate of MIT, where he earned a B.S. in Physics, and Stanford University, where he earned an M.S. in both Physics and Mathematics in 1983, and then his Ph.D. in Physics in 1987. In 1989, he was appointed staff scientist at the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility in Virginia and associate professor at Hampton University. And since 2006, he has been professor of physics at Yale and is a former director of the Yale Wright Laboratory. At this point, uh, I want to hand it uh, over to Keith Baker, uh, Dr. Keith Baker. Um, but beforehand, I do want to let all of us know that if you have any questions, uh, please uh, use the Q&A feature or the chat, and uh, we will respond to all of them at the end of, uh, of the presentation. Um, that being said, uh, thank you, Dr. Baker. OK, so Carlton, thank you very much. I, I'm really impressed with your uh, introduction, and I'm happy that, you know, Vita include your successes and not so much on your failures. So thank you very much for that. And it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to come uh, here remotely. And uh, again, as Carlton said, questions are welcome. So I will, if it's okay, then I will start. I'm going to speak about quantum entanglement and I'm going to focus uh, mostly on the Higgs boson decays, but I will start by giving you uh, let's just call it the run-up to quantum entanglement, uh, and, and then maybe uh, the uh, entanglement in uh, Higgs boson decays to vector bosons will uh, have more meaning. So this is done in collaboration with several colleagues, uh, students of mine and former students of mine and postdocs of mine. And thank you again for this invitation. So quantum entanglement, let's see, I guess, I don't know if I can get rid of this, or maybe I don't have to, but quantum entanglement, um, has different meanings. It can be something that is a nightmare and it can also be something that you love. So uh, I'm going to talk about quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement, uh, for example, uh, let's see. Uh, 
just a little. Yeah, so quantum entanglement is quantum correlations between entangled particles. So correlations can be both classical and quantum, but quantum correlations have their own, I guess, you know, definitions. So elementary particles described by wave functions, for example, and we can look at quantum entanglement between the different parts of the wave function. And I'll start with that. And these, as far as we know, have no classical counterpart. So let's start with it. One of the, um, one of the analyses that my students and I made uh, two, two or so years ago, I believe, it was, I think it was just during the pandemic or just before the pandemic, I forget which, but if you have, for example, a neutrino, a neutrino at Fermilab that uh, scatters uh, from one of the target particles, one of the nucleons in a nucleus that's in the target. This is a fixed target mission uh, experiment, sorry. So this neutrino scatters by emitting a W boson, and this is called the charged current weak interaction. So when it scatters this W boson, it emits this muon. This muon gets detected. So if we know the neutrino, uh, we know that it was the incoming particle, we then detect the outgoing particle, the muon, we know that this has to be a charged current interaction. So now we also know it's, uh, that it has a certain momentum. And when this has this momentum, it also has a de Broglie wavelength. Whenever we have a particle that has, that's traveling at a certain momentum, there's a wavelength associated with the de Broglie wavelength, and it goes as H over the momentum. So what this tells us then is for this nucleon, this nucleon, there is now this, what we call, um, we, we call it looking at a certain part of the nucleon, this nucleon part here. So this is the active region where the scattering actually takes place. So here's the scattering region and the rest of this outside of that, uh, outside of this is called the uh, region where there are spectators. This is the spectator region. So you have a, a region that is the, uh, um, target region, and then you also have a region that are the spectators. So this nucleon is what we call a pure state. Now, these are microstates that are part of the pure state. So if this is a pure state, then this region A here, which is the region uh, for the scattering, uh, the scattering region, is entangled with this region outside of that, uh, that is the spectator region. So there is entanglement between these two regions is uh, what we're showing here. So this means now that in this case, there will be what's, what uh, is referred to as a thermal component to what we see in this, scattering, in this scattering interaction. There's going to be a thermal component for the reasons that this quantum entanglement is what gives rise to it. An example is this, um, uh, thermal component in the um, region, the event horizon of a black hole. This is called Hawking radiation. So the gravitational attraction in this region of a black hole is huge. So this means that a particle uh, that's near here can actually turn into two particles that, that come from it. A photon, for example, may give rise to an electron-positron pair or something else like that. So you have these kinds of interactions that take place near the event horizon of a black hole. So they can uh, recombine this, uh, these two particles. They also can both be, uh, uh, go into the black hole. And there can be a case where this get, one of these will tunnel, one of these will get pulled into the black hole, past this event, event horizon into the black hole, never to be seen again. And its particle, uh, its uh, partner here can tunnel through this gravitational barrier and it can leave this black hole and go, uh, uh, you know, away from it. Now, here's the thing. We, the, the trying to detect this is, is difficult because of the cosmic microwave background radiation and other kinds of things in there. But 
these kinds of processes do handle. So just like in the scattering uh, uh, that we do here, and this was an experiment done in Fermilab. So there is the part that you can detect. In principle, you can detect this. You can see, uh, uh, I guess, the light that comes from this. This was shown a year or so ago in a group led by Harvard physicists. So you have this part that's shown in red that's detected, and then you have the spectator here. You do not detect the spectator, and that's what the spectator region, region is. Yet they are both entangled. So this is what happens now. There are a lot of details that I could probably give, but I wanted to just give an overview of this. My uh, senior graduate student, my next to senior graduate student told me this morning, don't try to go too deep, just make it at a level where we all can understand it. So let's say we have this kind of an interaction. This is uh, an experiment at Fermilab in Chicago, uh, outside of Chicago, Minerva. So we have an anti-neutrino, an anti-muon neutrino that scatters from this target, this CH target, and it gives rise to a mu plus, plus a pi zero, plus other stuff that comes out uh, that, you know, we don't need to, to really detect. It's just other stuff that happens there. So now we then look at the cross-section of this, the normalized cross-section for this interaction as a function of the momentum of this pion. And we also detect the, the, the muon and, and the pion are detected. And this is that data that goes with it, what's shown in black here. Now, in this case, theor the theorists have shown uh, that there is a component to this quantity that is a hard scattering component. And we show that in green here. This is hard scattering. And there is a thermal component that's described by an exponential, and that's shown in red here, this red dashed line. So you need both of those in order to reproduce or to uh, fit this data uh, that's shown here. And this is an example of quantum entanglement. It's because you have the region where uh, there is the spectator region and there's the region where there is the actual scattering. Those two are what give rise to this quantum entanglement that has these two, that, that has this point and the hard scattering part. So um, one of the things I'm going to point out is taking the integral under the, uh, of the area underneath each of these curves. We can take the integral of the area underneath the thermal component and the integral of the area underneath the hard scattering part as well. And I'll come back to that. Now, there's another thing that happens, and this was one of uh, one of the early results in Minerva where they actually did coherent scattering. So in this case, the neutrino scatters from the carbon nucleus as a whole. It actually gives rise to these other particles, but in a different way than what we showed before, because in the end, you also detect this carbon-12 uh, nucleus inside of the target. So you scatter from it and you uh, also detect this. What that means now is that there is no region A and B here. There is no region where the neutrino comes in and scatters in such a way that it emits this W boson that then samples just part of it. It samples this nucleon as a whole. This nucleon remains intact. The carbon-12 remains intact. And in that case, there is no thermal component there are no two separate entities that are micro uh, uh, states inside of this pure state. So in that case now, we only have this hard scattering part. This is something that we've known about for years. This hard scattering is in a lot of, lot of experiments. So this now is uh, something that people have known about. This thermal part is what we call the thermal part is uh, what uh, the entanglement is all about. The hard scattering part is, uh, is described by uh, polynomials and this, this thermal part is described by an exponential. And this uh, isn't a surprise because the Boltzmann distribution also includes this exponential part. Okay, so you can have both uh, thermal uh, uh, quantum entanglement and no quantum entanglement. That was in the electroweak interaction. The other has to do now, let's go on to proton-proton collisions. So at proton-proton collisions at the LEC energies are mediated 
in this case, by gluon-gluon fusion. You have these protons that are coming at each other at such a high uh, momentum, at such a high energy, that it is the gluons, the partons inside of the protons that actually do the scattering. So proton-proton scattering is dominated by gluon-gluon fusion here. So here's one proton that's coming in one direction. Here's the other proton that's going in the other direction. And when they scatter, they scatter, uh, you know, in a way that uh, there's overlap between these protons. So this overlap region is what gives rise to the particles that we're looking at. This is now the signal region in these two protons. And this is the spectator region in this proton, and this is the spectator region in this proton. So the calculations become a little more complicated, but the idea is still the same. You have a region of a proton that is probed in the PP collision. And in that case, you have this entanglement. You also have a region that is the spectator in both of them. So that's what we call regions A and B. Now, we, uh, there are several ways to proceed in making and now and going on to measure quantum entanglement and, and sort of what, come, what quantum entanglement gives rise to. So one of the things is now, in proton-proton collisions, in the case that I just showed here, this proton is a pure state, and it has this signal region and this spectator region. They are entangled. And you can describe this pure state with you have a wave function that has these two micro uh, states or these two systems, A and B, and they are separable, meaning that this is separate from this. And you have then something that is not entangled. If you don't, if, if this can be separated from this, this is called a pure state. If, on the other hand, they're not separable, meaning that they are dependent on each other. They are correlated. Then you have this summation over I and J, where this is uh, the region, the signal region, and this then is the spectator region here. This is what the wave function looks like in that case. So this is not separable and it's entangled. When only one term contributes to this state, then the state is separable and it's called, uh, um, it is not entangled. Otherwise, it is entangled like this, quantum entangle. So what happens here? Yeah. All right. So uh, this is a lot of mathematics. You don't have to understand it all. The one thing that I just wanted to emphasize in showing this uh, slide is that you can create a density matrix, a density matrix when you have this kind of entanglement here. It's, uh, there are other ways to do the analysis, but this uh, is the one that is, in the, my opinion and the opinion of many others, the best way to proceed in this kind of analysis. So you have a, a certain number of terms here, and each term has its own probability so that this probability uh, goes with whatever n is, n equals one, two, three, however many uh, uh, of these terms enter into this sum, and from that, you calculate this density matrix. And this is uh, related to the von Neumann entropy and Shannon entropy that you get in information theory. That's where this comes from. But for now, I, I'm putting that out there, and I'm just going on because um, those are details that don't really enter into much of this discussion. So now, in these proton-proton collisions, we made this this sketch or this, uh, I guess, this uh, figure to show how this works. So again, you have a proton. So along this vertical axis, you have time. And along the horizontal axis, you have space. So you have particles that move in space and time. And this space and time now has its limits. Yeah, you, you all have probably seen world lines. The point is they don't go outside of here. This part out here is world line, and this part out here is world line. You have a proton, two protons at the LHC that come in, and they're going forward in time, and they're going in, uh, in space. One is going in one direction, and the other is going in the other direction along this spatial axis. They collide here, and they collide in such a way then that they give rise to particles 
that go on like this. Um, there is the signal. So this hash region here is meant to be the detector in this uh, diagram or in this, I don't know, figure. <laughs> and this is the part that captures those uh, particles that come from the signal region. This is what we call the signal part. This is the detector that detects them. So you have those that are detected and you also have those that are in um, that are not detected. They are in the, uh, um, what do you call it? The, the other region where you don't detect them. And you also have it for this other uh, particle as well. So you will have this in the signal region, then you also have the bystander region here. These go on and do not get detected. However, these are correlated in a quantum way, so they are entangled. And this is this is what we are showing here again. In proton-proton collisions, these parts that you do detect, they are the ones that are here, and then they are uh, entangle to these that you don't detect in your experiment. Similar to what happens in these particles, these um, entangled particles at the event horizon of a black hole. You also see this, and not just in uh, high energy physics, but also in atomic physics. The details don't really matter, but this is from the Walt Greiner's lab at Harvard, where he has an ensemble of particles, these uh, rubidium atoms, and he has them on these lattice sites uh, of a of a laser, uh, you have these lasers come in and make these sites where these rubidium atoms can sit and they're not interacting in general. So they are all uh, uh, pure states, except in those rare occasions where you do have some correlation between them. Now, what they do is they can also send some perturbation. They can send a um, uh, some something that gives rise to now, you change these, these uh, um, these uh, positions where the uh, rubidium atoms sit. Now they start to interact with each other in such a way that this entire uh, collection as a whole is a pure state up here, but now these microstates give rise to something that is quantum entanglement. This, these are now entangled in the way that this experiment is done. So that's why you have this in, um, in, in the region where they're entangled, you have this, what looks like a thermal behavior in uh, Boltzmann distribution. They also see this thermal behavior in at atomic physics, whereas up here in a pure state, you do not have, you just have this one, basically this one pure state. So that also, this also happens in, in atomic physics. People see it in condensed matter and so forth and so on. All right, so moving on. This is an example at the LHC of charged particle normalizations. So in this case, again, uh, uh, you, uh, the way that this works, you'll have uh, both a, a signal region and a bystander region. Uh, and this then gives rise to this data that's shown in blue, these blue squares here. So the way to actually um, fit this data, you have to have both the hard scattering part that's in green and the thermal part that's in red. And then you add those two together to get this blue, um, there's a blue uh, uh, line under, under these or curve under, uh, that you don't see it so much because they're hidden by the red and the green lines. But that's what gives rise to this. Uh, that is, an, uh, I should say, this shows you that there is entanglement, quantum entanglement in this kind of an interaction. So we also did this, and this is what really makes me proud. Obviously, other people had looked at some processes before now, but we were the first to see evidence for it in the Higgs, uh, show evidence for it in the Higgs production and then its decay. So in this case, this was a combination of both ATLAS and CMS where uh, the data uh, in both cases, they use Higgs to gamma gamma, Higgs decays to, to, to gamma rays, and Higgs decay to four leptons, and Higgs decay to BB bar. They all fall along this line now in that case. And the way then, that, again, that you fit this data is use both the thermal part and the hard scattering part here. So this shows that even in the Higgs boson, 
even there, there is this evidence for quantum entanglement. This is interesting because the Higgs couples to matter in a way that's unlike any other particle. It couples to mass. So what happens if there's additional physics that we uh, want to look for? Okay, that was the point. I also want you to notice here this R equals 0 0.15. I'm going to come back to that as well. All right. Another example at the LHC, however, is what we call diffractive production. Now, a diffractive produ production is where you have this proton and this proton. This proton is going in one direction. This one is going in the other. But now what they do is they don't scatter from each other by overlapping. They scatter from each other by emitting a photon. And this photon comes from the proton as a whole not from one section or one little area of the proton, but as this pure state, this proton as a whole. So it's these photons now that interact and give rise to these muons. And this is now, you also get particles in the final state, but they are not entangled. This is not entanglement. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the two photons themselves uh, interact and give rise to these mu muons. But there is no entanglement between the wave functions of this proton and this proton, because, again, these photons come from the proton as a whole. So that's what we call diffractive. This is uh, a double diffraction, single diffraction. And, I'm sorry, uh, non-diffraction, uh, non single diffraction, double diffraction. These are diffractive events. There is no thermal part. There is no entanglement. So just the hard scattering part alone is what fits this data. All right, so what we do now is this is a, a how do I say it? This is a flare that send, that's being sent up. It says, okay, here's the part. These are from experiments where there is no entanglement, and these are the parts where there is entanglement. You get this by taking this ratio of the area underneath those curves. And in this study, T here is the uh, hard scattering part, and T sub TH is the thermal part that's described by the exponential. This is the part that gives rise to quantum entanglement. If there is no quantum entanglement, this ratio is equal to one, and that's what this is. Th there is nothing along the vertical axis that matters. It's just that you show that, uh, so in these experiments, for example, green here, these were gamma gamma scat uh, scattering at Opal. This is at Daisy in, in Germany uh, many years ago. And you see here that they, uh, when you get the area underneath the curves, this is what you get uh, in, the, uh, in the vicinity of one here. Similarly for the um, uh, Zeus experiment in the same way. You have these photons that are scattering, and they don't come from one region inside of the uh, incident particle or the scattered particle. They come from, from uh, oh, I'm sorry, not the scattered particle, the incident particle. So these also give rise to this ratio being one. And similarly here, this is another experiment, H1, Daisy. So these are markers for absence of quantum entanglement. And when you're around this area here, around 0.1, five to point two three or something these are the points that indicate there is quantum entanglement here all right so um i wanted to then i guess i should go on quickly rather quickly but stop me if you need to i wanted to talk about i want to zoom in now on the higgs boson um, by itself the higgs boson is the 58th elementary particle uh, in the standard model and as carlton was saying now the standard model is complete um except for there there are some things that uh we don't quite understand but these are outside of the standard model uh, so there is still more physics to come even though the standard model <laughs> is complete so all right so this is what we do in particle physics so the standard model of particle physics has been described by some as the most successful theory ever developed. And we can tell what happens sort of 14.7 billion years ago, and we can determine what's going to happen within the standard model 14.7 billion years from now. However, and, and there have been experiments that have been performed where we were able to predict what was going to happen using the standard model, and they all show that they are done correctly. The prediction 
lines up with the data. So the standard model is great, except there was one problem. There was one big problem. The problem was, in order for the standard model to work as well as it did, all particles within the standard model had to have zero mass. They had to be massless. But we know that's not the case. Particles have mass, otherwise none of us would exist. Particles that do not have mass travel at the speed of light, and in traveling at the speed of light, they don't coalesce to make give rise to mass. So none of us would exist in that case. So the question then becomes, what gives rise then to this standard model? Uh, the, the what gives rise to the particles that are in the standard model, which is this crowning achievement of 20th century physics? So there were, now, there were several different possibilities. The Higgs mechanism is the one that, in my opinion, in the opinion of most people, was the most likely way that particles got mass. Uh, there were others having to do with extra dimensions and um, uh, the universe in um, that, that these extra dimensions gave rise to an early universe. You know, I taught a class uh, uh, in the early years here at Yale, I taught a, a graduate level class on uh, particle physics. And this was, uh, I'm an experimentalist, not a theorist. And one of the students in there raised his hand when I was talking about this and said, well, can you tell us about, doesn't this, isn't it the boundary conditions in the early universe that gives rise to this? And, you know, in a classroom full of students, I had to look at them all and say, I have no idea. I'm an experimentalist. I'm not <laughs> There is so anyway, uh, uh, it just goes to show that professors don't know everything. Okay, so in this case now, uh, it's not just what gives rise to particles, but why is there this difference between particles? The heaviest known particle in the standard model, the most massive, is the top core, and it has a mass of roughly 170, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 173 to 175 GeV. Whereas if you look down at the up quarks, down quarks, electrons, muons, these don't have very much in the way of mass comparatively. So what gives rise to mass and why is it there this, this difference, this large difference in masses? So this is why, this is what led to these uh, discussions about uh, uh, how to look for uh, the, um, these particles. So I guess my time is getting up. Uh, so I, I need to move ahead. I just wanted to let you know, since this is the NSBP, National Society of Black Physicists, that uh, first of all, uh, uh, these, 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 this is a time lapse of the data that we collected. And you see that we knew what was going on here and out here. These were all uh, 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 predicted. These are backgrounds. But we saw this bump that comes here between 120 and 120, uh, I'm sorry, 35 or so. This is the Higgs boson. And I also wanted to point out that my postdoc and I, as Carlton pointed out, um, Theodota uh, is from Greece and uh, she had these skills in using machine learning, especially boosted decision trees. And we were able to see this evidence for this, this Higgs boson uh, peak here early on. There's also this peak here, but this is, this is something we know. This comes from a standard model process and all of this does, but this was something that was new. So I was very happy. And then of course, we were able to party after that. It, different people had different ways of partying, okay. So now, the, the, uh, this quantum, uh, I'm going to go through this rather rapidly. This is the Higgs boson. We detected one of its decays is into a Z boson that's on the mass shell and a Z boson that's off the mass shell. And quantum mechanics permits this. And they go to four leptons in the final state. This Higgs is the only particle of its kind, the only fundamental particle of its kind. It has zero spin and positive parity. So that means now that these two Z bosons, which have spin one and negative parity, they both have to behave in a certain way so that, that parity is conserved and intrinsic spin angular momentum is conserved. And so we're looking at these Higgs decays into four leptons, and in this case, mainly electrons and muons. So in this case, 
If you go to the Higgs boson rest frame, this is the Higgs boson in here, and they're just sitting there. They decay into these Z bosons, a Z and a Z star boson. Now, in this case, if this is this, these uh, Z bosons have spin, have intrinsic spin, if this is there, if this is at rest, these two have to come out uh, in this decay back to back. They have back to back linear momentum. In addition to that, now there is the spin, intrinsic spin angular momentum. So they both have to be right handed, meaning that. The spin that this Z boson has, its intrinsic spin, if it goes in a direction that's opposite this, uh, this red line, which is the, uh, mo the momentum of the particle, the linear momentum, it's called left-handed. Uh, and so if this one is left-handed, this one also has to be left-handed because they have to equal uh, total uh, intrinsic spin of zero because that is always conserved. Similarly, if their spin direction is in the direction of this linear momentum, in this case, this one also has to have a spin that's in the direction of this linear momentum. So these are right-handed. And there's one more uh, that's transverse to it. Uh, I don't go into those details here, but these are all things that have to happen. The angular momentum has to be conserved. So that's what gives rise, in this case of this longitudinal polarization, to this ambiguity. They both have to be right-handed or they both have to be left-handed. And because either of them is a solution, then the sum of them also is. This is what we call superposition. So both vector bosons have linear polarization. They have the same handedness. Uh, they have these two distinct polar uh, possibilities. And this can be used to test Bell's inequality. And that's what quickly I should go through this. I apologize. This is, I go through this. So we analyze the data that we get. In this case, it's Monte Carlo data. And you look at this information on an event by event basis. Even if we look at 2,000 events, you look at them one at a time, you get the mass of the Higgs, the mass of the Z boson, and the mass of the Z star boson. This Higgs goes between 120 GeV to 130 GeV. That's the region where we look for the Higgs boson. The, mass, the Z boson has a mass of 91.15 GeV, but it also has uh, some wings to that distribution, so it can go a little below this and above this. And then this one is the off-shell Z boson, and it can go down to even lower masses. So for each event, you have to get this information. Then from that, you, you get this um, uh, in the um, quotient, uh, the division of this Zim Z star, this off shell one, by this on shell mass, uh, Z boson mass. And that F is uh, something that you uh, hang on to because we'll need it. I'll show it to you. This, this is simply um, the ratio of these two masses. And from those, you calculate these, these quantities, which we call H alpha beta. And then from those, we get this quantity, which is a measure of the entanglement. We get this quantity, this is a measure of the entanglement entropy, and this gives the, um, the limits on those. This one, uh, when you get up something up around the uh, vicinity of 1.3, then you're talking about quantum entanglement. This is an example of it, and in this case, these are, when you get uh, up in the vicinity of log of three, you don't have, it's less than log of three, but it's in that vicinity, then you're looking at entanglement entropy. And so that's what we do here. You uh, use, uh, uh, you, uh, there are several ways to handle this, but one way is to just uh, make um, uh, a new quantity, call it alpha, which is given by the mass of the Higgs square, which you know event by event, one plus the ratio of them times the mass of the Z square. And then you also have beta, two times square root of two times F times MZ squared. So then from that, you can, you can take what H44 is, you can calculate it, H16, H33 here, and you can make this density matrix. This density matrix is two times this quantity. You can see most of the events, uh, most of the entries here are zero, but um, this comes from the theorists that uh, we're working with. So you have H44, H16, H44, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Okay, so you have that. 
From that, then you can calculate this quantity, what the entropy is, and the quantum entropy uh, entanglement, sorry, quantum entanglement is. And you see that this is um, the maximum that uh, you can have for quantum entanglement. And these are the events that are in that region. They're up above sort of, you know, 1.3 and above is what we're look, mainly looking at. And these are entangled. You also have this entanglement entropy by take, giving, uh, getting these, um, using these density matrices. And this is uh, the maximum that they can get to. And this is up here. Anything that's down here uh, in the vicinity of zero, those are backgrounds. So uh, in, a, in, a, in just a nutshell, I just wanted to say that these are with very narrow cuts on them. This one says that you have to look at the Higgs mass between 124 and 125 GeV. And similarly for the Z and the Z star, uh, uh, only one GeV above and below their central part. On the other hand, when you have a loose cut, then you invite a lot of background. And this is what that looks like. You, in addition, now you still have this quantity up here that is that shows quantum entanglement and it goes down to somewhere in here. But you also will have these, this part that's in this vicinity. And these are just background events. So what you want, and, and the similarly for entanglement entropy. So what you want to do is to make sure and, and uh, have cuts and do the analysis that gives rise to just the signal that you're interested in. And similarly, you can look for this Bell's inequality. This is what Alan Aspect and his group won the Nobel Prize this past year for by showing that, uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna say this quickly. Albert Einstein had misgivings about what was called quantum entanglement because his theory of relativity, of special relativity, messages or information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. They have to travel at a speed that's less than the speed of light. However, quantum entanglement, if these two particles are entangled, even if they're, one is in this galaxy or, and one is in another galaxy, if this one has a certain, if this one is measured and it has a certain spin angular momentum, going in either in the direction of its momentum or opposite, this one that's in another galaxy instantly uh, reacts to it. It also then has intrinsic momentum that the sum of those two have to give rise to the uh, Higgs if, it's, if they come from the Higgs boson. So that is what entanglement is, quantum entanglement does for you. And this is why this is still a big deal. And I'll, I wanna end on that. Uh, this this just shows the, the data region here, and this is what gives rise to what we're showing up here and up here. So without uh, spending much time on this, I just wanted to say this is one of the reasons why we're doing this at high energies. All the other experiments in atomic physics and in condensed matter physics, they do outstanding work, outstanding. But those are all at very low energies, atomic energies, electron volt energies, and using massless photons. This, uh, this analysis that we're doing is uses tens of GeV massive particles, the Z boson and the Higgs boson is 100, you know, uh, so GeV. And the uh, momenta that they have are huge, tens to even more than that uh, hundreds of GeV. So, so I gave a talk once and I made this comment that I, I, I wanted to use quantum entanglement for something other than just quantum entanglement. I felt that doing this experiment in that regard is simply dotting the I's and crossing the T's. There were some atomic and, and condensed matter physicists in the audience and they said, no, you're wrong. This is absolutely necessary. There's going to be some other effects that show up. Uh, there are going to be relativistic effects. Um, Einstein and his group felt that there should be something that they call a hidden variables. A hidden variable theory gives rise to a different uh, uh, entanglement or, or uh, this Bell's inequality. It has to have a Bell's inequality that is less than two, whereas quantum entanglement has to have something that is higher than that. I'm sorry, not less, uh, yeah. It has to have something 
Bell's inequality is if I3, which I showed here, is less than uh, uh, two uh, here. Uh, uh, yeah, here. Whereas in the case where you have quantum mechanics, which shows that there is quantum entanglement, then you get these positions up here. Now, this is Monte Carlo, and the Monte Carlo that we use only uses quantum mechanics. So the fact that we don't see anything here uh, just means that we now need to look at data. So, so okay, so I wanted to leave with that just to say that entanglement by itself is something that's important, quantum entanglement, but I'm really interested in using it as a tool, for example, to look for Di Higgs physics at the LHC for many other reasons. So, okay, I'm over my over time, so I'll, I'll, that, that's the end of it, uh, this talk. And if you have questions, I see that there's some here. Um, okay, at Stony Brook, we had a, a talk by another NSVP member, Marcel Howard from the University of Pittsburgh where he talked about how photons could Compton scatter off of the cosmic microwave background and how they are uh, theorized on gravitons potentially doing some type of scattered, uh, yes. And there are also thermal bath calculations. Being that your work is more on the Higgs, is this a possible convergence of studies? Could this lead to understanding of gravity? So. That's a great question, and this is one of, this is, okay, uh, I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to make the point that quantum entanglement and Higgs boson indicates what I show here is not the story. It's not the whole story. It may not even be just the beginning of the story. There's lots of other things that come into play here. First of all, um, we show uh, this, this difference in slope of the data that we showed that we had taken, the, um, uh, the what gives rise to it is this hard scattering part. And then we were the ones that proposed, it also includes this thermal part that is, uh, this thermal part comes from quantum entanglement. There are other competing ideas. And um, we, I think it's fair to say that we have ruled out some of them, a lot of them. One of them is when you have all these particles in the final state after the collision, they bump into each other and doing so they thermalize, they lose energy and, and it's colliding in each other. And that's what gives rise to it. But we've shown that even in those cases where, for example, uh, you had lots and lots of different particles that bump into each other, you still get both this thermal part and this hard scattering part. And so people are starting to, 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 to look at that. But I do wanna say there are lots of different ideas and I think it's going to be your generation, young, young people who are actually going to, to tell what it really is. But okay, here's where we stand now. All right. Um, and Dr. Other, Baker. I would just yeah. like to cut in, um, first of all, and thank you for such an amazing and interesting talk. This is only my second talk um, on quantum entanglement like that I've ever seen. And the first one was a long time ago. So the idea of using quantum entanglement as a tool is I, I've seen I can see there's been a lot of progression, which is awesome. So um, I'm actually going to be the monitor for the Q&A session. So okay. I can read the questions for you and you can focus on formulating the answer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, thank you. Of course. So once again, you guys post your questions if you have them. So we got that first one covered. Uh, I'll, I'll go with Farah's question next, which by the way, is our immediate past student representative to the NSPP board. Okay. And Farah says, this was a great talk, thank you. I'm definitely interested to understand further how quantum entanglement is used for searches at the LHC. I'm very familiar with limit plots, but is there a way to find exclusion limits and, excess, and excesses using methods you've described? Yes, I'll give you one example. And this is one that, um, uh, uh, it, it, it'll probably be, I probably would have been, you know, <laughs> asked to retire or something by the time we get to this, I don't know. But um, what has happened at the LHC is the discovery of the Higgs is fantastic, it's wonderful, but the Higgs has a mass that's in a vicinity that um, theorists had not expected. 
And they expected the mass of the Higgs to be different, uh, actually higher than that. So the question now becomes, this is due to something. It's not just an accident, because from that, there are other um, quantities that get derived from the mass of the Higgs boson. So the questions exist, and it's thought that the best way to answer this is to look for di-Higgs. So you have a Higgs boson that's coming along. The Higgs decay uh, into, the Higgs couples to mass. So this one Higgs, if it's uh, what we call an internal line, you don't actually detect the Higgs, that Higgs actually then can decay into two additional Higgs. It can have a mass that's greater than just the mass of the Higgs itself. So it, uh, the 125 GeV, it can have something even greater. So it can decay into two additional Z, uh, um, sorry, Higgs bosons, Higgs star. So now, one of the things that happened in the discovery of the Higgs, and I'm actually proud to tell you this, so bear with me. Um, uh, I, uh, the, the Higgs boson decay to uh, bottom quarks was thought to be the way to discover the Higgs. Um, and then after that, uh, because the Higgs uh, couples to mass, so you want to look at very massive particles, Higgs and tiles, but the Higgs to Z and Z star that also existed. However, now you don't detect the Z bosons either. You detect their decay products. They decay into leptons and other stuff. Uh, they can also decay into uh, uh, hadrons and everything like that. So my students who worked with me, uh, so that was, the, that was the channel that I was interested in for other reasons. It was because I helped to build the transition radiation tracker anyway. So when I chose to use that decay uh, process to look for the Higgs, uh, uh, nobody really said anything to me, but my students came to me and said that students, other students and postdocs were asking, why is your professor going out there? You'll never see it. But it was one, in fact, in the end, it was one of the discovery channels, the Higgs to ZZ star and the Higgs to, four, uh, to two photons. Those were the discovery channels. Some, so the thing you learn is that signal strength alone doesn't isn't what wins. It is signal to background. The Higgs to ZZ was what's, it was what's called the um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, I forget what it's called. It means that there's very little background, almost no background. So that's what I'm proposing for this di Higgs search. Except that now you'll have two Higgs bosons. Each of those Higgs bosons will decay into two Z bosons, and then each of those Z bosons will decay into two leptons. So you're going to have eight leptons in the final mm. state. And you have to know which, which leptons come from which Z, and I'm proposing to use entanglement. You have to have this entanglement, the linear momentum, the spin angular momentum, and all of this has to add up. So that's one example of what I consider to be a tool. Uh, this quant using this quantum entanglement as a tool. You asked about gravity and uh, Shit. yeah, I wanted to say, I really hope that someone from your generation takes that on and makes it work I, as, as just one example. So I hope that's an answer to your question. Awesome. Um, thanks for that. And looks like we oh, just got another question. Um, ah, I'm not going to try to, uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce this name, but, uh, we have a attendee with a question that says, fantastic talk. First of all, could you double touch how entanglement could be used as a tool in taking care of decoherence? Yeah. So in quantum computing, yes. So, so if you have um, two particles that are entangled, then it means that when something happens to one, then it also has to happen to the other. So if you have one where it uh, interacts in such a way that, all right, so when it's moving and it hasn't been detected or it hasn't uh, undergone some kind of a reaction, it will have a superposition of states. It can both be right-handed or both be left-handed in the case of the Higgs boson decays to ZZ star. Now, on the other hand, if now 
you measure it, or if something happens to cause one of them uh, to, to uh, go through a process that is the same as, for example, measurement, then it, uh, what you call collapses into one of those states. It's either right-handed or left-handed. And when you have particles that are entangled, that means the other particle also has to fall into the appropriate uh, state. It has to be left-handed or right-handed, depending on what the element is. So this decoherence is something that happens in quantum computing. This is a, this is a, uh, a problem with them. Uh, why is it that quantum computers, they have this noise that comes up uh, all the time? So this was a, um, a recommendation from one of the theorists that I, I had a conversation with. He was the one who uh, pushed to look for this qubit decoherence in quantum computing using the tool, this qu quantum entanglement as a, uh, as a tool to get at that, uh, to see are they still entangled or are they not entangled? And if so, you know, go from there to, to determine, you know, what are some of the conditions, what needs to be removed from this quantum computer or what needs to be dealt with to lower this decoherence. And that, that in a nutshell is, is what, what this happens. There are details, of course, that go into that, but that, that's you know, overall, that's what uh, yeah. this is uh, pointing to. But thanks for the question. Yeah, these, are, these are all just fantastic questions. Wow. I'm glad you all aren't in my graduate level class. Right, Carlton? Uh, <laughs> I would have to look at you and say, I have no idea. <laughs> I have never taken an undergrad particle physics class, but. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Let's say yes. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So before uh, we close out for today, we have uh, Dr. Colbin here with her hand raised. Yes. Hi, Dr. Baker. It's Trina Christian. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes. How are, How are you? For those of you who don't know, uh, yes, Dr. Baker was on my dissertation committee when I was at Hampton, and he also taught me introductory nuclear physics. And I still have the book, and I still have all of my homework, says Dr. Baker. <laughs> and so, it's uh, good to I remember see you. you like it was yesterday. And not only that, you did really well. You were an A student. I, I shouldn't say that. I, I, you're supposed to keep those things quiet. But, yes, <laughs> well, did and really I did theory. Yes, you did. You sure did. You're a theorist. And you also became an administrator at Hampton, didn't you? Didn't you work and in the... I, I, was at Ham I was at Howard first. I went to Howard and did my postdoc with the CIA. Then I became an administrator at Howard. And uh, me and Dr. Lowe taught some classes. Um, Walter Lowe, and then I came home uh, back to Hampton, and um, I was assistant provost for a little while. Now I run my own business. That's, yes, oh, yeah. that's what I remember. So congratulations. Wow. wow. It's good to see you, Dr. Becky. You still look the same. Yes, and, and all y'all are like, oh, she must be 100 years old. No, that makes you 200, Dr. Baker. I'm going to take that back. <laughs> I'm going to lock you in a room with my wife, okay? And then I want you to say that to her, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say hello, and I'll thank you guys for making me a panelist so I could uh, talk to him directly. And those of you who have had, had him as a professor, he's awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Wow. I'm glad I left when I did that. Because well, I, I understand. Me too. Me too. That's an off, off conversation. But yes. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Well, it's wonderful seeing you. Wow. Oh, and you Dr. Wow. Wow. You're young. I'm also um, the vice chair of the uh, Forum on Diversity and Inclusion for APS. And oh. uh, Dr. Buck is the vice chair for one of the other committees, Society and Politics or whatever the heck the name of that other one is. So we've talked yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Okay, please give him my hello. Yeah, he's at William & Mary now, is that right? Yes, he is. Uh -huh. Yes, he is. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. Good seeing you. You too. It's wonderful seeing you. Yeah, and whatever you're doing, you keep at it, okay? Because you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tell your friends they're not putting you under enough pressure, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely tell them that. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Coleman, for that. And thank you for everybody for attending. Um, Dr. Baker, again, thank you for an amazing talk. 
It was very interesting. Appreciated it. I know we've never met uh, in person. Hopefully that'll change. We have the conference coming up. Yes, you're going to probably uh, other other opportunities in the future. But I one of the things I really like about creating this platform and and this community is that we have the opportunity to connect and reconnect and just generations of knowledge and and wealth of knowledge um, to draw from for for future generations. I agree with you. And I want you all to know that I'm being genuine when I say that, uh, you know, I'm happy to give these talks. I'm happy to teach because there will come a day when one of you or more of you are going to give these talks at an international conference. You're the ones that's going to tell what this is really like. And you know what? It won't include anything that I have said. You're going to come up with your own way of explaining this. And I will get the reflected glory because when you show up on the evening news as this great, wonderful scientist, I'll say, you know what? I actually talked them once. I actually gave a talk once so they were there. So I want to see you all blossom, okay? I've enjoyed my career. Don't get me wrong. I still have a few more years or something like that. But I'm looking forward to seeing what you all, what your generation does. And I, I just think it's going to be splendid. So, yeah. Thank you, though.